Here's a simple illustration of a nation state. So here we have the boundaries of a state uh, being this blue area, uh, and we'll overlap on top of that a nation. So when a nation and a state have the same boundaries, that is called a nation state. Now let's talk about a multi-nation state. Key to a multi-nation state is that, of course, it has to have at least two or more individual nations within it. So in this simple schematic, we have a majority nation, showcased in red, and a minority nation, they're illustrated in green. Next up are multi-state nations. Key to them is where you have a nation that overlaps into two or more states. The first example being a nation state in which it overlaps into a neighboring state. Oftentimes what will happen is a nation state that is overlapping into another a state, a neighboring state, will often want to claim that area as their own. And so that's what we call an irredentist movement. Oftentimes these are going to be areas where we see some conflict. And there's going to be a specific example I'll mention later regarding Somalia, in which it is a good example of a nation state that overlaps into neighboring states. The other example of a multi-state nation is one in which it might be a minority nation in two or more countries. So think of this green area that overlaps into two states, but it's a minority nation in both of those states. Now I'm going to introduce you to a key term that I'm going to sprinkle in, in and out of the following discussion, and that's ethnic cleansing. Simple definition of ethnic cleansing is when a more powerful ethnic group forcibly removes a less powerful ethnic group, or a less powerful group, let's say. Key to this is ethnic cleansing. There's no, there's no moral code. There's no, okay, well, we only, we only uh, you know, try to get rid of military personnel. Nope, you wipe out everybody. It doesn't matter. It's more than just soldiers. It doesn't matter if it's women, children, elderly, uh, disabled. Nope, wipe them all out with the goal to eventually become a unitary state. And so ethnic cleansing is a means to an end to wipe out an area so you can take it over and create one ethnically or one uh, specific culture uh, homogenous region. So that certain culture dominates the entire area because it essentially cleansed the area of minority groups uh, or minority nations. Here's a fictitious country showcasing ethnic cleansing. So we have a majority nation showcased there in red. Key to that, though, is the majority nation, they don't have access to a coastline. So the coastline is key resource, a uh, key transportation mechanism. So that's one negative uh, that the uh, red people, the majority nation within this multi-nation state, uh, might have. Further, you might find that the resources, particularly would say oil, might be found in the pink area. And so another key thing that we see with this red area is not only they, you know, they don't have access to a coastline, but they don't have access to resources. So then, what's the solution? Uh, they just essentially just wipe out everybody. And so the majority nation utilizes ethnic cleansing. Of course, I'm not justifying ethnic cleansing at all. I'm just explaining how and why it's done. In ethnic cleansing, they wipe out that uh, area so they can get access to the coastline, or they wipe out another area so they can get access to resources. And so this is a fictitious country, and I'm not justifying ethnic cleansing at all, but providing an understanding for how and why it occurs even to this day. The following maps I've downloaded from the University of Texas Libraries, and all of these are publicly available maps from the Central Intelligence Agency over time. I'm going to apply a lot of different concepts discussed in the readings regarding territories and conflict in nation states, multi-nation states, and multi-state nations. First off, we have the country of Yugoslavia, which no longer exists. And so the country of Yugoslavia, uh, was uh, we see over there on the left-hand side, uh, was one entire area and, of course, had its red, white, and blue flag. And we can see it over here on the right-hand side. And what it had is these individual republics that made up Yugoslavia. So Yugoslavia was, at one time, one country in which it was divided up into individual parts that we can see here over on the right hand side. I'm going to interject a key term, a shatter belt. So in the case of Yugoslavia, at one time it was one individual state, one individual country. However, this area historically, but also in the future, uh, will continue to see its borders change. And so when we see areas that are constantly having the boundaries change, we call that a shatter belt. It's a key term. We'll also see this in Africa. We'll see this in parts of Latin America. We see this in parts of Asia, in which you have these individual areas. You're going to continue to see the boundaries drawn and redrawn as new states emerge, uh, but also boundaries change. As this ethnic groups in Eastern Europe map showcases, 
However, Yugoslavia is definitely a good example of a multi-nation state, or should I say was a good example of a multi-nation state. We can see the areas that Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, all those areas you see different colors. And we can see the key up there in the top right-hand corner as far as explaining what those different ethnic groups are. Even further, if we go way back in time, just the boundaries of one of the parts of Yugoslavia, Serbia, it's changed over time. Going back to the 1100s, there in 1196 with that green line representing the boundaries of Serbia. Then we see later on the purple line, the boundaries have changed. And then the boundaries have changed again, we see the blue line. And of course today the boundaries have changed. So this is an area of the world where the boundaries have always changed and will probably continue to change. In the 1990s, Yugoslavia broke up. So here's a snapshot of time of 1996. We can see in pink the area that is des uh, described as Serbia. However, today, uh, what we see is Montenegro in pink and Kosovo, which is in pink, are their own individual states. And so once again, Serbia, even as recently as since 1996, has further had its boundaries changed and the locations of them move. Uh, a great example of how this area is what we call a shatter belt, in which the boundaries are constantly going to be changing. We see this in other areas of the world, especially where we have separatist movements. So key to understanding well, what's going on here is you have individual ethnic groups, individual nations that want to rule over themselves and so the area of Kosovo wants to rule over themselves because they're much different than the Serbians in which in 1996 they're underneath their rule so now when we look at Serbia the previous map included Montenegro which is shown here in red representing the Montenegrins their own distinct nation but also the Kosovo area which is showcased in kind of a goldish brown which is Albanians which we can see Albania is the country just uh, south of Kosovo so you can see how Serbia is you know its its own entity was definitely a good example of a multi-nation state which included Montenegro and Kosovo at the time. So what ended up happening logically, the Montenegrins said you know, we want to rule over ourselves. Then the Kosovoans said well, we want to rule over ourselves. And so these are examples of independent states that are relatively newly formed that are essentially individual areas that have wanted sovereign sovereignty. They wanted to be able to rule over themselves. And so these were originally separatist movements that had achieve their objective as far as reaching secession, uh, separating and ruling over themselves. What we have here is the flag that is Kosovo, one of the newest countries. This is an interesting country in which it's uh, and actually a Muslim country that is pro-United States, which you don't see that too often. What's going on there is why? Well, the Serbians were wanting to wipe out the Kosovoans. Why in Kosovo there was resources that were seen as being quite uh, quite attractive, quite lucrative, quite, you know, something which economically the Serbians could benefit from. And so essentially what was happening was ethnic cleansing, in which they're trying to wipe out all the Kosovoans. What happened was the United States came in to save the day. So in the late 1990s, the United States came in, fortified this area, but also ended the ethnic cleansing of the Serbians over the Kosovoans. An interesting tidbit is Kosovo, inside this area of Kosovo, there actually are minority Serbs. So those minority Serbs, well, they would argue, well, wait a minute, we're though also uh, been ethnically cleansed by Kosovoans. So you can kind of see how this area is very complicated. But in, in any event, we can see how this is an example of a, uh, a, a multi-nation state that since broke off, formed its own state, and it makes sense because they are much different than their neighbors. They are Muslim, which we look to the north, Serbia uh, is not Muslim. Now, since Kosovo has become its own state, it's slowly worked its way as far as adding countries or adding states that recognize Kosovo as a state. Once again, international recognition is a key component to is a state a state? Is Kosovo a state? But well, we can see the international recognition is definitely growing. What's interesting is there's some interesting, uh, some particular patterns as far as who recognizes Kosovo. First off, many Muslim countries recognize Kosovo because of course they're going to want to recognize them because they're going to want to see more Muslim countries being added to the world's total. Further, Serbia, they definitely do not recognize Kosovo as an individual state. They still recognize it as it's it's part of us. They're just kind of, they're gone loopy, they'll be back, uh, but the, you know they're going to recognize Kosovo uh, internationally. Further, the Russians and the Chinese are very apprehensive to recognize Kosovo as a country. 
Kosovo as an individual state. Why? Because in those countries, in Russia and in China, you see minority nations that say, well, wait a minute, if you recognize Kosovo, a minority nation within Serbia, then why not recognize us? We're a minority nation within China. We're a minority nation within Russia. And so you can see how these are very complicated. Because once again, there's this precedence. If you allow Kosovo, if you say Kosovo is a state, then you're going to have internal areas with your own country say, well, wait a minute, what about us? Now let's talk about the Soviet Union, something that is, of course, no longer existent, but key to it is its, under, you know, its understanding as far as the addition of a lot of member states to the world total since the 1950s. In fact, since 1990, over 30 countries have been added to the world, with about half of those being countries from the former USSR. Here we have a map of the Soviet Union showcasing the individual republics. And so what they did is they realized it was a very large country. Uh, they have you know, a, a lot of variation in terms of ethnic groups. So although it was a communist state, very much you know, thought of as a unitary state, what they did was they divide up the country in these individual republics. And if you look at this map, those individual republics, although hard to see, uh, don't do a good job of containing uh, certain ethnic groups. And so the Soviet Union, world's largest multinational state in its day, all these individual groups, all these individual peoples that we see scattered throughout the country, and there's really no particular pattern. And so this is key to understanding a lot of what's going on today in this part of the world, is you have a lot of separatist movements, you have lots of secession, and it makes sense. You have these individual groups, these individual ethnic groups, for example, that want to rule over themselves. In individual religions that want to practice a religion. They want to you know, freely practice a religion and uh, they also want to rule over themselves. And so this is something going forward to see is going to continue to see conflict in uh, the former Soviet Union in, in Russia, which today is the world's largest multinational state, which once again, not referring to area, uh, I'm referring to the different ethnic groups, the number of different individual nations within the one state. Now we're going to focus in here on Central Asia, which we have uh, these uh, uh, individual countries, uh, which were former republics of the Soviet Union. For example, Kazakhstan. Uh, so we have all these landlocked countries, the biggest of which is Kazakhstan, which was made uh, more popular by Borat from uh, the movies. And so Kazakhstan, well, what's going on there? So what was the view of religion in Soviet Union? So Kazakhstan, a former republic of the Soviet Union, uh, that the view of it was it doesn't exist. Uh, so you weren't really freely allowed to practice uh, your, your certain religion in this former Soviet Union. So you can see the rules all of that in terms of the number of churches in Kazakhstan, once again a former republic of the Soviet Union. And so what happened was once Kazakhstan, uh, once the Soviet Union fell, and these individual republics essentially became their own countries, became their own states, gain sov sovereignty, uh, essentially what happened was the churches came back. And so I'm not suggesting that communism is a good thing. What I am arguing, though, is that communism, in the case of the Soviet Union, there's always been ethnic conflicts. There's always been ethnic disagreements in this area. But by eliminating religion, it put a lid on a lot of those bubbling conflicts. So that when these conflicts or when the Soviet Union fell, then people came back to their religion. People came back to you know wanting to rule over themselves. And so once again, we can see the the role of the Soviet Union breaking up this multinational state, breaking up and these individual republics, then becoming their own states. So in the case of Kazakhstan in 1990, they only had 600 churches, whereas by today, there's 4,000 plus churches in the country. Why? Now people can freely practice whatever religion they want to, now that the Soviet Union no longer has existence and Kazakhstan is its own individual state. Further. Kazakhstan is also one of the few countries of the world in which it's actually de-urbanizing. It's actually seeing people move from urban areas to rural areas. Why? Well, during the communist era, during the Soviet Union, they set up Kazakhstan to be strictly an area in which its only purpose was to be an industrial powerhouse, to make stuff, uh, to manufacture stuff. And so typically that's going to be found in a city. Uh, you're going to find the large industries in an urban area. Uh, and so what ended up happening was people then migrated to uh, the key industrial areas, but then over time, as Kazakhstan then became its own country, a lot of those industries essentially were no longer, they were kind of wiped out, uh, they had no more use, and so essentially what happened was people then moved out of these industrial uh, cores, these industrial urban areas, creating a situation which actually the country is de-urbanizing, which we don't see too often in the world. 
Now we're going to a country that's been talked a lot this decade, and that's Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is a good example of a multi-nation state in which there's two nations within the one state. So to understand the conflict that occurs uh, there in Ukraine, to understand why you see uh, you know, these groups shooting down planes, uh, why do you see Russia supporting certain areas, it's key to understanding that well, it's, it's ethnically uh, quite diverse. This map, I think, will explain a lot of what's going on in the Ukraine. We can see the red areas are represented as uh, places where the Russians uh, are, are, are in large concentrations. So it makes sense why eastern Ukraine, first off, has more people that are pro-Russia, uh, people that are more likely to support um, anything that supports or helps Russia, uh, versus the western part of the Ukraine, which is very much pro-Western, or let's think of it as being pro-Europe or pro-United States, uh, in which they want to, you know, free their country. They want to, you know, they want democracy to thrive. They want, you know, to open up their, their country to international migrants, whereas the what, eastern part, eh, it's definitely much more Russian. Uh, and it would rather have, instead of a pro-Western focus, a pro-Russia focus. We can especially see that in the southern tip of Ukraine, there's a peninsula, which kind of looks like an island there in the Black Sea, and that's the Crimea Peninsula, uh, which we can see it's heavily uh, colored uh, there in red, and so it's dominated by Russians. So it makes a lot of sense why the Crimean Peninsula, why the people of that area would want to rule over themselves, and they want to be part of Russia. So because of that, Russia has since gone in, brought in some military, brought in some backup, because they see this area is also strategic in terms of resources. And I'm not going to get into the oil flow or the uh, the different flows of resources uh, in this particular area of the world, but key to uh, the Crimea Peninsula, key to that area that's domin dominated by Russians is also its strategic location in terms of transportation of resources. Here we have the island of Ireland, which is separated into two different parts. Northern Ireland, which is a part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, but much, much the two, pretty much the two-thirds of the southern part uh, of the map is Re the Republic of Ireland, which is its own country, its own state. Uh, and so here we have, once again, two uh, states that are represented on this one island. Uh, but the Republic of Ireland much different than Northern Ireland. The Republic of Ireland, uh, you're going to see overwhelmingly much more Catholic. In fact, 92% of the population is Catholic. However, in Northern Ireland, you don't see as many Catholics, only 42%. So if you go into Northern Ireland, one of the key cities is Belfast. And U2, uh, the band U2, the rock group, uh, wrote a song, Bloody Sunday, which was about a conflict there in Northern Ireland in the city of Belfast where the Catholics, uh, the Irish Catholics, uh, were persecuted, were, were essentially being trying to, you know, people were fighting them, people were trying to wipe them out of the area. And so this is not something you really see anymore uh, since the 1990s, but this is an area of Europe, of what we would think of as stage three or stage four country, a developed country, in which it's had a recent conflict, a recent series of conflicts, and it makes sense because of the ethnic differences, the different nations that share this one island. A little closer to home, we have Quebec. Uh, Quebec is a province of Canada in which it's had this a few different separatist movements over time. Uh, so Qu Quebec, it's uh, more recently had uh, a, a, a vote in which people thought, well, should we become our own state? And, of course, it's not just as that simple. Uh, you know, of course, Canada would have to approve this as well. Uh, but for Quebec to become its own state, they first off had to take a vote. And they've never really reached 50%. Why? First off, in the northern part of Quebec, you have a lot of what we call, in the United States, Native Americans, what are called in Canada, First Nations, that say, wait a minute, well, if you're going to become your own state, if you're going to you know, separate from Canada uh, and secede and become your own state, well, well, why not us? We're a different ethnic group. We're a distinct ethnic group. We want to rule over ourselves. Further, and so they, were, you know, they weren't going to vote for a Quebec uh, sovereignty. Uh, then over in the eastern part of Quebec, you got some English-speaking uh, individuals, and they weren't going to support uh, you know, Quebec becoming its own state because you know they're not really French speakers uh, like uh, the majority of, of Quebec. And so this is one of the, some of the key things that are blocking Quebec becoming its own state. But this is Canada as a whole, no doubt, is a good example of a, of a very peaceful state uh, that is a multi-nation state where it has multiple nations within it. In this case, uh, the minority would be uh, the French-speaking Quebecois. As mentioned beforehand, there's few examples of multi-state nations. In the case of Somalia, it's a good example of a nation-state in which the nation overlaps into a neighboring state.
So the area that's referred to as Greater Somalia, we can see is showcased there in red, uh, or the pink area. And so we can see the Somali, the ethnic group, the Somali people, overlap into Ethiopia, overlap into Kenya. And so subsequently, you can expect there's some conflict or some, uh, some, some issues uh, that occur in both of those overlapping areas. And so in the case of the Horn of Africa, we can see how the Somali people are an example of a nation state that overlaps into neighboring states. But of course, it's not that simple. So here's a map that shows clan distribution within uh, the Somali ethnic group or the Somali nation. So even within the Somali nation, there's individual nations. And so we see this area, it's going to have you know, conflict. It's going to have, you know, it's going to be unstable for, for a long time because of these individual groups, uh, these individual nations uh, that are part of a broader group, but also uh, individual clans. And so there's going to be disagreements, territorial disputes. So we can also see that the border between Ethiopia and Somalia, it's really, it's a geometric border. It's a straight line. It really doesn't do a good job of separating uh, different groups, different areas from one another. So it really is going to kind of of a, a boundary that's debated. It's just, you, you'll see often in Google Maps, for example, uh, it showcased instead of as a, as, a, as a solid line, as a dotted line, kind of indicating, well, we don't really don't know, and even the people there don't know. And that's the problem with, once again, geometric boundaries or straight lines on a map. They don't do a good job of separating people from one side uh, from the other. Now, example of a multi-state nation in which a minority nation overlaps into other states and is a minority nation in those other states. So essentially, it's a, a, a nation that's a minority nation in uh, two or more uh, states is Kurdistan. And although an older map, this map here showcases the Kurd area or the Kurdish area uh, in the Middle East and uh, the former Soviet Union there as the red. And so in northern Iraq, you find uh, a large number of people that are Kurds. So much of a nation that they obviously they have their own flag, but they aren't their own state. Uh, and so once again, they are a good example of a multi-state nation, a minority nation uh, in two or more countries. In this case, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, you find a minority uh, Kurdish people. Now let me try to orient you to this map. So here we're looking at a uh, a 3D view of the area that's Kurdistan. It's showcased in kind of a gold or goldish color. So we can find that Kurdistan is up there in the highland areas. Uh, and so you can see in the foreground or closer to the bottom is a uh, country of Iraq or the present day uh, country of Iraq. So we can also see Baghdad. And so Baghdad and much of Iraq is actually uh, rather flat, but the Kurdish held area is quite mountainous. And so what that means is there's going to be more resources. There's all going to be a variety of minerals and natural resources found in mountainous areas, whereas you know the, much of the rest of the of the country of uh, of Iraq is sand and oil. And so that's the thing that was very attractive uh, uh, to uh, Saddam Hussein to this area was the fact that whoa look all these resources and so what did he do oh, ethnic cleansing and so Saddam wanted access to this area he wanted to have more control over this area because of the resources found there and so one of the things part of the uh, United States coalition um, whether it be the first Iraq war or the second Iraq war, we came across mass graves. We came across, essentially, the evidence of ethnic cleansing. And why was ethnic cleansing occurring here? It was all about wiping out the area of its people so that they can then get access to this mountainous region and the key resources found within. So we also see the resource curse pop up here in this particular area. So once again, Kurdistan is an example of a multi-state nation, a nation that is found in uh, multiple uh, uh, states, but on all of those, a minority nation.